It's nice to be back. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, so the title of this one is uh, yeah, Reason versus Faith and Emotionalism. So we're going to be dealing with, uh, I'm going to spend most of the time, I think, on faith, but I think faith and emotionalism are related. Um, so we've heard a lot about reason uh, throughout, over the course of the conference. Uh, that rationality is a virtue. Ayn Rand thinks reason is important in, in ethics. It's important in life. You're supposed to embrace reason. You've heard a lot about that already. But there's something funny, I think, about why we have to make a big song and dance about you should be rational. You should use reason. It's a little weird, I think, that in this day and age, of the kind of achievements that we see going on around us is scientific, technological, artistic, and so on. It's just, it's a staggering, the achievements that are going on. Uh, I just have images of various kind of scientists doing uh, kind of advanced work and research and things. And that you have to make a case for this. Um, you should, I, I think you should think that that's kind of weird. That Not that we're making it, but that there, a, a case has to be made. You have to stand up and talk to people about reason, and you should make this central in your life. Um, uh, but you do. I mean, but so let's think about this. Everything in this room, in this building, the building, everything on you, everything in your pocket is man made. Literally everything, the entire building, nothing in it is natural. Zero. From your uh, eyeliner to the shampoo and the soap you used to the, pla what do we got here, plastic, to the dyes that are used in this, to the, how do you make a weave? And the machinery that goes in, I have no idea how to make anything in this room at all. Um, the scientific understanding that goes into making, uh, thank you, Thomas Edison, the lights, uh, the microphones, the laptops, the, the, be the ability to use this to communicate, I mean, and uh, from, uh, absolutely everything, your socks, your phone, the doors, okay, wood is natural, right? But somebody has to go build tools, they have to cut it down, they have to plane it, those doors are laminated. Uh, it, it, literally everything. And to the idea, it's like, yeah, why should you follow reason? It's like, how do you get all this stuff? And you can abstract from it. It's not just this in this room, it's in every building. It's throughout the city, it's throughout the cities of the world. You think, what's not a product of human reason, human intelligence, of, of your ability to think, to grasp the properties that things have, to understand what they are, to their causal abilities, like what can they do? What can we do with them? How do they interact and interrelate with things? Can you put these together? What happens you know, when you do that, right? It's a lot of experimentation, asking questions, exploring. Um, um, what's not the product of that process, that cognitive process that we, a stream, Wild fruit that's probably too bitter to eat. I mean, I'm, you can probably find some bananas or oranges at, at lunch or something like that. But even these are cultivated. They're brought over here. They're shipped and so on. There's almost nothing that we rely on. Okay, there's air. But there's almost nothing that we, we take for granted, live by, rely on that's not a product of reason. And the idea that I have to get up here, <laughs> I, I don't resent you, but, and make a big deal, a you should follow reason. Um, I think you should find that a little odd, and, but you do have to make the case because it's not, it isn't obvious, and it isn't, uh, and it isn't as if there's no reason to make the case because one of the things we're often told is that reason is limited. Reason can't uh, penetrate the mysteries of life the, and meaning, the meaning of life, the origins of life. Um, uh, that man somehow needs something else, something other than reason. He needs, let's say, faith or religion. or He has to have something else to, to provide him with the kind of answers that reason is just unequipped to answer. Um, and so he needs a different tool. I mean, so that's, that's one perspective on why there's this kind of this kind of thought that your reason isn't enough. Um, but another one, do I have a slide for this? Yeah. 
Another one is throughout the history of philosophy. I mean, this is going back to the ancient Greeks and on, on through history. Uh, there's been a conception that, well, you've got reason and you've got emotions. You've got thinking and you've got feeling. And they're not the same thing. And they're not the same thing. Um, and on the one hand, so reason is, is good for certain things and you use that as a tool to figure things out. Um, but then the way they look on reason is, or, or on emotion is that your emotions seem to give you another form of knowledge. Um, so reason tells you one thing, emotion tells you another thing. And sometimes you find your, 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 it seems like your reason and your emotions are clashing. Um, there's something you think you should really want or you think you ought to do, um, but you don't want to do it. And you find sometimes there's a kind of a conflict between the two, and the two, it seems like you have two different sources of knowledge, two different sources of guidance. And so it's not just reason. And we're human beings, right? We have reason and we have emotion. It's part of our nature. Um, and so one, uh, so one question is, what's uh, the relationship between reason and emotion? And I think we'll talk a little bit more about that in the Q&A than in the, in the talk. Um, and is, is, is emotion uh, a valid or appropriate source of guidance in life as a sort of an addition to reason or as an alternate, alternate source of guidance? Um, and the other issue is faith. What is faith? Um, and is it, is it an appropriate form of reaching knowledge or providing you with guidance? In other words, it, to, it, we've been making the point that uh, reason, well, this is Rand's view, uh, reason is your only means of knowledge. And as a result, your only source of guidance, your only appropriate source of guidance. Uh, so what I want to try to do in this talk is to say, and faith and emotion aren't alternatives. They're not alternative sources of knowledge. They're not, they, they shouldn't be alternative sources of guidance. Faith, we'll start with that. Um, people define faith in different ways, and again, you, I won't go through all of them, but if you ask in the question period, we can talk about those. Um, when I use faith in this context, I'm not talking about faith as one's religion. So I'm of the Jewish faith or of the Christian faith. I'm not talking about that as a, as a religion. I'm talking about faith as a, sort, as, a, as a means of reaching knowledge, of a way of holding ideas, a way of populating your mind with certain beliefs. Uh, as you go by faith uh, in a way that's in contrast to going by reason. Um, and I think, it, I mean, you can put this in different ways. I think of faith as uh, it's the acceptance of allegations in the absence of observational evidence and rational proof. Or you can put it in another way, which I like a little better. Um, it's in the absence of evidence or in spite of the evidence. Because it's not like there's, it's not, so you can, you can hold a, a belief on faith for which you think there's some evidence, but if the evidentiary situation changes and it looks like there's a lot of evidence against it, you don't modify the belief. So it's, that, I mean, I think that's a case of you're holding on to it in spite of the evidence, in spite of new evidence coming in, it just doesn't look like this is true, and you're, yeah, it, yeah, it is, yeah, it is, and you don't want to consider it, you don't change your views. Um... And faith is often connected with, with religious belief, I think for fairly obvious reasons, because um, most religions, I mean, well, I say all religions, because that's how I think about religion, is it depends on some notion of the supernatural. There are some things called religions which don't depend on that, but I don't really think of those as religions, I think of philosophies. But uh, if you have an element of the supernatural, you have an element of the unknowable. Um, and hence, people think, well, you need faith for that because you, you couldn't establish it by reason or something, so you need another way of coming to know that. Um, but there's a real problem with faith uh, in the sense that it's a dead end. It, it's worse than that, but I'll say, it's a, first of all, point one is it's a dead end. Because you can't, faith, you, if you hold a belief on faith, and someone else holds a different belief on faith. I, believe, I have faith that there's one God. And you have faith that there are three gods. Okay, how do we sort that out? How do we figure out which one of us is right? What's the means? <laughs> we find, okay, well that's true. No, but, but it's, there isn't any means. Faith isn't a methodology that you follow. Like you observe evidence, 
you connect things, or you infer truth from truth, and so on. It's not that. It's you hang on. You accept. Um, and there's, there's no means of distinguishing between the true and the false. So faith gives you no means to distinguish between truth and falsehood. Um, so in that way, it's not only you can't distinguish it, you can't, we can't sort out differences on the grounds of faith. Now you could say, like suppose I say, uh, I, I have faith that there's one God and you think there are 300. Um, I might make an argument, to, and theologians do, um, monotheistic theologians do, and they make a case for, well, God is all perfect and there can't be more than one all perfect. Be- you know, they, there's ways of trying to kind of create an argument to show that um, if something is the highest possible to be the highest, there can't be a second highest or another, then it wouldn't be the highest. There's a way of trying to bring um, uh, inference and argument into the picture. But what's going on now? Well, two things are going on. But what's one thing that's going on now? What's been brought back in? Some kind of form of thinking and argument and stuff. So reason always have to, has to do the heavy lifting. Well, reason does all the lifting. So, in other words, if you're going to hold some belief and you think it's true, the only way to back that up, to ground it, to demonstrate to yourself, yes, I, this is why it's true, is to bring in reason. Why? Reason is your tool. It's your only tool for figuring things out, for establishing what's true, uh, and for reaching an understanding of things. But in the absence of reason, it's just tenacity. You hang on to a belief. Um, and I, I had a student in, in university when I was teaching, and I used to teach the introduction to philosophy classes and so on, and, and um, I always used to have a unit uh, that dealt with God for about the first five weeks of the course. Uh, and I don't teach atheism or anything. We, we were looking at various kinds of arguments from uh, theologians, from, from different philosophers and so on. And uh, a student came to my office hours, and uh, he said, oh, Professor Smith, I, 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 want to, I want to run this argument past you. I, we talked about this argument here, and I, okay, I, I get that that's a problem, but let me bring this other argument for the God's existence. And I said, oh, yeah, have a seat, that's fine. And, um, and I, I, I told him what I, thought, what I thought was wrong with the problem. I said, this is not a valid argument, and here's why, and so on. He said, okay, I got, I got another one, I got another one. Uh, so this went on a few arguments. And then I, I, I stopped and said, wait, wait, wait a second. If you wheel out another 17 arguments, and these are the basis on which you think that there's a God, and I, if I were to show you that these don't work, I mean, I don't know what they would be, but if they don't work, would you give up your belief in God? And to his credit, he kind of, kind of thought about it, introspect a little bit, and then he's like, No. And I said, well, that's important to understand. It's important to understand that that when you put forward the arguments, your belief in the conclusion doesn't depend on the arguments. You're bringing in these as if you're playing the same game I am. As if we're both, that's not a game, but uh, it's that I'm trying to, figure out arguments for what's true, and you're doing the same, and you're not really doing it, at least not in this case. Um, and you're holding, on to, you're holding on to the belief for other reasons than intellectual reasons. It's not that you've seen the evidence, and these are your arguments, and now you understand it's true, and you're showing me the reasons why you think it's true. No, you're not. It's important to understand that, and, you, to, and to think about, is that a good way of reaching and holding on to beliefs? Because I don't think it is, but you have to think about that, uh, you know. And this is one of the reasons I think that you can put faith as, um, this is one way I like to think about it, it's, it's the acceptance of a belief on emotional grounds rather than on intellectual grounds. You, you hang on to it because for some reason you want to hang on to it. You want to believe it's true or you're afraid to believe it's not true. And I think that's important to get, because if, if it's really that, so let me get back into this issue of like the various ways in which people think about faith, because sometimes people will say, and this is a way of differentiating, are you going on faith or are you not going on faith? Sometimes people will say, well, we all accept lots of things on faith. All of us do. Um, 
part, that's part of growing up, right? You, your parents tell you things. You, can't, you didn't go around validating all the things that your parents tell you. Uh, you go through school, and you kind of, okay, in 1972, this, and you're just kind of taking notes, and you're taking the test, and you're picking up a lot of things which you haven't personally verified. And so sometimes people will say, look, don't, don't attack faith so much like this, because look, it's a part of life. We all do it. It's a, it's a necessary part of life. You can't start when you're age four and you validate everything one by one, by, you know. Um, but there's a difference in that and, and faith, because one, you could fundamentally, you, you could theoretically verify these things. If somebody says, you, uh, uh, there's this place called Montenegro. <laughs> well, I've never been there. Sorry. It, it will happen. Um, uh, but you could go there. You could meet people from there. You could learn some of the language. You could find. You could learn some of their political system. You could go there. You could. It's, it, this is. It's something that's in principle verifiable. And if you went there, <laughs> there's no Montenegro. It just goes from one state to another state to another. There's nothing there where it's supposed to be. You think what, what, what's what's going on? Uh, it's also the case that it's also not true that you don't that you just accept everything on faith as a child. Um, but it's that you're, so if you're going by reason, even if you're relying on partial evidence or it's not fully validated, it's that you're, the way you hold the belief should be, should change as the evidence, as the evidence changes. As you learn more about it, you build a stronger case for the truth of a proposition, then you should be more confident, increasingly confident that the belief is true. And the more in which there's the evidence is not really showing or adding up to the conclusion, the more counter evidence you're seeing, you should be less and less confident to the belief. So it really does, it, it, it's, not, it's not exactly, it's on a slider, but it, it, your confidence in the belief should change according to that status. And that's, that's, that's that the evidence means something to you. Often people uh, think one of the reasons why faith is so important uh, is that it, it's important for religious reasons because there's, a, there's supposed to be a God and you, you can't really, I mean, I would say some philosophers disagree, that you can't establish that there's a God by reason. Uh, but then it goes back to the issues like which God? And again, that's another issue. If faith can't sort that out. So I think that in the end, so we'll, we'll go get to emotions in a second. Let's go back to these figures here, Buddha and Ganesha. Um, so I think that faith really boils down to one of two things, and ultimately I think one. It's reliance on authority, right? People said this is the case, and you're just supposed to accept it. You can't validate it, but you're supposed to believe it, so you believe it because authorities told you to believe it. Um, or you believe it just because you want to believe it. It's, for some reason, it, it, has, uh, it provides an emotional force for you. you, you like you're afraid of dying, for example. You don't want death to be the end. And so the, the, this holding on to this idea that there's a God, there's an afterlife, and that it provides some kind of a psychological, uh, something psychological for you, and you want to hang on to it. So I think in the end, faith is a form of emotionalism. It's a form of relying on your emotions um, rather than on your reason. So let's, I'm probably taking too long here, so let me switch over to emotions. Um, we all have emotions. We have a rich emotional life. Uh, I just, there's just a number of different kinds of emotions there. Um, and they do give you some kind of data, so to speak. They do give you, in it, they do indicate things, right? Um, if, um, if so, there's some change that happens in your life, uh, so, so say you get a promotion uh, at your work, and it makes you sad. That's an indicator, right? I just got promoted, and people are thanking me, congratulating me, patting on the... Why did... That's something, right? Because, like, you know, and it may be... And, you know, now, wh what does it tell you? Just that this made you feel sad, but that's it. But it doesn't tell you why that made you feel sad. It doesn't do the digging and the thinking and introspecting and trying to uncover what's underneath that emotion. But it gives you something. 
but it's not a form of guidance. It doesn't tell you what to do, well, you should quit your job, or you should um, not want a promotion. It doesn't give you any guidance, and it doesn't tell you anything beyond something makes you feel a certain way. Because um, it, may, it may be that you really don't like the job, and the promotion means that you're going to have more responsibilities, and that you're going to have to move to the city center, and this is going to be a big conflict with your wife, and this is, or whatever it is. Um, so the reliance, so so emotions are important. You should. Their ob objectivism is all in favor of emotions. They're great. Uh, they're they're the form in which we experience our values in the world, uh, and they're the in their form of uh, uh, in which we experience the joy of living and so on. So they're great, but they're not means of knowledge. They're not means of guidance. They indicate that you feel something, and that's it. And that that's important data, you know, but you need to think and to go on, and to go on to figure out what's underlying them and so on. But what I call emotionalism is you rely on your emotions uh, as guidance, as this is telling me something to do, without doing the thinking to undercut, well, why is it that I feel like that way? Is it that I don't like my job? Is it that I'm afraid of the responsibility that could come with this? Is it... Is it this is the gonna, I'm going to earn more money and then I'm going to be more stuck in this job. I'm not going to want to quit, but I've been wanting to quit for some time and now I'm making twice the money and now it's just another nail, you know, and in in it's making it harder for me to quit. All of that's thinking. All of that's reasoning. All of that's trying to uncover what's underneath the emotions. Um, so again, sort of like, it, it's sort of like on the issue of trying to prove a God. Anytime you bring, you have to bring in reason to do the work. Um, because it's the only thing that can do the work. And also, like faith, an emo emotions can't distinguish between the true and the false. It can't tell you what's true. It can't tell you what's false. They're automatic reactions that come up as a result of the, 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 the values that we hold, what we think is important to our life, and what we think our status of that is in the world. Are our values being threatened? Are they being uh, promoted? Uh, did I gain a value and I'm happy? Did I lose a value and I'm sad? Am I anticipating uh, the loss of a value and I feel fear? You know, the, but reason has to do all the lifting to figure out uh, um, how to live. Because following just emotions without doing the thinking underlying it is just like flying blind. In the same way, it's a similar with the issue of faith. It's this is, this is what I hold and I won't connect it with other evidence, other arguments. I'm not going to look at those. I'm not going to try to integrate the various pieces of evidence that are coming in, I'm going to hold these isolated and protected from other things that I know or could know. Um, but if you're really on a quest for truth, this can't be your method of operation. Because neither of those are going to lead to truth. They're, they're not, neither of them are paths to truth. And so what about this idea that, well, if you're, look, if you go by reason, it's somehow cold and calculating and so on, but I don't think that's at all the truth. I mean, to live a life by reason doesn't mean to squash your emotions. It means to understand them. It doesn't mean to not enjoy them. It means to understand them. Um, a life of reason uh, is a life devoted to the pursuit of truth, your own honest, clearest sense of what you think is true, um, following the evidence, piecing together the bits and pieces of, of data and th that you have to kind of reach what's true. Uh, and I think that's an exciting way to live. And it, it doesn't erase emotions. It, pu it, it puts them into their proper place. I mean, you don't need to kick them down, right? <laughs> you, should, you should experience a rich emotional life. But it's about a clear perception of, of what, the, what, what the truth is. Um, because ultimately, the, the facts are, I mean, we live in a big world of facts. And that's the world we have to deal with. And if we don't deal with it, if we close our eyes, if we hold beliefs, we isolated from evidence and argument, if we run on our emotions that we don't understand, you're not going to be able to deal with the facts that you need to deal with in relationships, in life, in anything. Okay, so I hope this is just another element or another side or another angle uh, on the issue of the value of reason. Um, we're going to go to the Q&A, and Ankar is going to, we're going to, Aaron and Ankar team up here again, and we'll go to questions. So thank you very much.
you to drink. You. Yeah. Hey guys. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I have Hi. a question. Uh, do you think that we need to tell our kids about the Santa and about the two fairy and other things that are grounded by faith? <laughs> I mean, neither of us have kids. Yeah. So that's one thing to say. Um, well, thank you very much. No. Uh, when it comes to the issue, I don't think this is all that important in the end. Um, it's a good question, though, because I, I know a lot of people who do, won't do it because their, their view is, I'm going to tell my kids a fantasy, a fake story, and they're going to believe stuff and anticipate, oh, he's going to come down the chimney or whatever it is. Um, and then it's not really true, and then sometimes they find it out, and I personally, I wouldn't tell my kids that, but I, I, I don't think there's anything really too wrong with it. It's, it, it is, because it, it's part of, it's a, it's, it's a fantasy, it's a story, they're children, you don't, if they're 30 and you keep telling them this, and they say, oh, yeah, yeah, you really screwed up your kid, you know, but it, it doesn't take them too long, and you, they get, what, five, six, seven, or whatever, and they start asking questions, and then you kind of giggle together. Yeah, but, I mean, I agree, it's not a huge issue, and there's some people exposed to objectivism who think of it as it's a major issue, but I wouldn't do it. And I also think if you're raising a kid properly, he would be immune to it. So, I mean, I was, a, I w I was not raised religious. Um, we celebrated Christmas and so on. I never thought Santa Claus is real. <laughs> Um, and it doesn't take any of the enjoyment away of it. It's just as like when you read other books, fairy tales and so on. I didn't think there's literally princes and things. But you can imagine. And it's fun to do so. And so you can have all the enjoyment of it. And the idea that you have to think, well, he's really real. And he's out there somewhere in the North Pole and so on. And if you're really raising a child to think, it's like... It's not very hard to get. <laughs> this is not... This can't... I mean, if you were telling me real, there's something wrong with you. Um, and the, so if, if you, I think if you're raising a child right, there was both, they would be very, very skeptical of it. And there would be no reason, like there'd be no incentive of why to do it. Um, so I wouldn't do it and I would have no reason to do it. That's the, so the idea that there's some enjoyment in, in um, falsehoods, I, I don't see anything like that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, I think that if you, if you accept reason uh, deeply, you have a certain way of arguing and of thinking, and you sort of accept the idea that if somebody presents a better argument, you accept it if you don't have a better one, or at least think about it. But people who have a um, big connection to faith, which was what you mentioned, they sort of reject that idea of reason in the first place. So when you discuss with them, and this might be about religion or politics or ethics, it's really difficult to get to them because they don't even get your method of thinking. So my question to you is, how can you even reach them if they have re rejected reason, which is all the tools you have to talk to them? How can you get to them and get them to consider it and to leave that faith behind so they can accept reason? Yeah, well, if you think, if you think it's important enough with a, in general or with a particular person to get into a discussion like that and try to move the, move the needle a little bit, um, then you need to have a different conversation. I think because then the conversation isn't about God, it's more about reason, or you, can make the, or you can conduct the conversation about God from the perspective of it's, how do you know this stuff? You know, and get it to, like, so, you, so, what, you, so what, get to what their perspective is on reason. And I, I don't think it's that hard to get someone to understand that you can't figure... You can't reach the truth by faith. I mean, but you, you have to ask them, what do you mean by faith? When you accept something on faith, it's usually it's, I accept it on trust. Fine. Trust in who? If it's trust in God, well, did God tell you something? And then you have to figure out, uh, is it trust this character? You know, did, do, like, is it direct? Is that the authority on which you're, you, the person you're playing, putting your trust in? Well, unless God's talking to you directly and you have voices in your head or he came to your apartment... It, that's not what's going on. The, you know, the trust you're placing is in trust in authorities that have said things and various people have collected works of stuff stuck in an old book. And you're, but, but is that how you get your knowledge? And what, but what about this? And like when I was reading the book of Genesis or whatever, it's people look, live to 800 years old. Well, like, that's ridiculous. People don't live to 800 years old. But you, you think that's true? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
because, you know, there, uh, there weren't all these carbs and stuff, and people were more paleo diet, you know? And it, it, no, I've heard people make this <laughs> point. Because they have to, you know, they had a healthier diet, and there wasn't, like, pollution, and it, that's not thinking. They're not really thinking. They're trying to, like, surround it with, like, stuff that looks like thinking. Uh, but I think maybe you just need to have a different conversation, different argument. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, hi, I really like the part about you know using reason for guiding one's personal life. Uh, what keeps puzzling me is um, you know lots of advertisement and marketing campaigns and all that is uh, appeal to emotion, and it seems to be an advance that we made as a society that this just seems to work better. So do you think it's more than, you know, the society kind of drifting, you know, not being rational led to that? Or like advertisement could work better in a more rational society? Like, you know, in an objectivist society, the adverts would be rational? Or is it actually, you know, here we appeal to reason, here we appeal to emotions, and like, there is a place for both? Well, I think when it comes to marketing, uh, what they appeal to are values. Uh, I don't think it's directly that it's emotions, but that's how they tap into the emotions. They appeal to your values. Do you want to be smart, sexy? You know, it's the way they present things. If they, they show a, um, like a Jaguar, and then they put next to some kind of the Venus de Milo, it's kind of, ooh, elegance, art, art, <laughs> right? But they, it's like, well, are you interested in elegance, design, form, art? Then you'd like this Jaguar, right? So it's the, it's the way they kind of tap into what your values are. And sometimes the values that they're tapping into aren't very good values. Right? Look at what your friends will think if you're smoking Lucky Strikes, right? And it's like, and everybody's like, ooh, you know, you know how it is, right? All these advertisements, and it's like, yeah, okay, so your friends will think, but that's not really a great set of values, right? Um, but they appeal to values, and that's the way to tap into the emotions. But people, people have the values that they they do, I think. But do you have anything more to say? Well, I just the reiterate the point that you're making. So it's not all values are irrational. And so you're putting in emotions, and you're trying to put it, it, it sounds like you're putting it, like, that's not rational. They're appealing to emotions, that's not rational. They should be appealing to reasons. But values can be on either side. That's a part of the point you're making, that you can have good values or bad values. But what that means is rational values or irrational values. And some marketing appeals to irrational values. But the problem there is not the appeal to values. It's the appeal to things that are irrational. But that can be, um, um, you can have irrational reasons too, cognitive things. Yeah. So the issue is, are they appealing to something rational or irrational? Not, are they bringing in values and emotions and there's something suspect about that? That's not the issue. Um, and it is, yes, I mean, the, the more you're able to think, the more you can sort through advertising. And I've watched many commercials and I think, how is this going to make me buy a product? <laughs> Um, it doesn't seem relevant at all. And there's others that it, because you're trying to convey information in marketing about your product and so on. And some is very effective, I think, and some isn't. But you can think about that. Um, and the more you're a thinking person, the more you don't just passively react to things. You actually think like, is this a reason to buy this? <clears throat> well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you for your talk. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering what you thought about the idea of taking a leap of faith, as you would say it, so where maybe all the evidence and reason is against you, but you need to kind of have faith in yourself and what you can do in order to maybe invent something or create something. For example, J.K. Rowling going to 12 publishers and not getting her book published, but then she had the faith in herself that she would get it done, um, or inventing an airplane where everyone's telling you it can't be done and then you have faith. Yeah, it's a, that's a good yeah. question. And so I don't think of that as faith. Okay. Um, because if they started to write a novel and they realized I'm terrible, or I actually don't know even anything about the craft of writing and you're just failing and failing all over the place, it's like, yeah, you shouldn't have confidence that you're good at writing novels. Um, but it's, I, think, I think what it took is self-confidence. And I don't think what it takes is faith. It takes a certain amount of will um, and a certain amount of self-respect that says, I want something better. I want something different. I won't let the haters and the naysayers, you know, uh, be the ones to stand in the way of who's going to tell me what I can do and what I can't. I'm going to try, damn it. And if I fail, I fail. But I'm going to try. I'm going to make a go of it. Um, and I don't think that's really faith. Um, I think it's marshalling one's own resources. 
you know, because if you really had a life where you just fail at everything, everything, I don't think you'd really have much of a will to do it. Like, you have no track record with yourself. But if it's, no, I, no, I look, I, I raised a family, I did this, I, I went to college, it's not like I can't do anything. It's, I can, but I have to put the effort forth, and it could be scary, and you need, to, maybe it's a bold move, and it's risky. Yeah. yeah. And the kind of examples you're bringing up are issues about independence. So there's this kind of view that 50 million Frenchmen can't be wrong, but they can be wrong. All of them can be wrong. So in the situations where it's, their t it's some, the same thing happened to Ayn Rand. The Fountainhead was rejected by all kinds of publishers. And she listens to, like, what are the reasons for why you think this is no good? It's too intellectual. It won't sell, it won't, no popular audience will buy this. Her books have sold in the millions. And she has to think, like, is this right about the story or are they all wrong? And her view was, they're all wrong. Um, and the same with the Wright brothers creating flight. It's, everybody says it can't be done. Yeah, but what are your reasons for why you say this? And if you think you don't really have any reasons, then I'm going to, I have some certain hypotheses about how this is going to work and so on. And you continue down that path. And that's an issue of independence. And it's an important issue in life. But it's not faith. It's, it's, you're looking, it's not just, they say, it's why do they have this view? And if they, you find they don't have reasons for the view, you continue on the path that you're on. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. Um, so my question is, going back to more about religion, um, I did grow up in an extremely religious household, so I've seen how people, the argument is, well, because God says so, uh, because the Bible said so, etc. And I've seen a lot of young people who basically, again, going back to the nature and nurture, I feel like they are told, and because basically they're, it's instilled into them, and they're brought up with fear. They live their entire lives like that, and there's no change. There's no free thought, in a sense. And so my question is, would you say, psychologically speaking, in the effects of the human brain, that faith is stronger, more powerful than reason because of ignorance, blindness, etc.? And therefore, do you think that there is a hope that there will be religion that will die out? Or do you think that there will always be these people who are kind of blindly following religion or whatever dogma in their lives? Well, I think the more, the more, so I'll address the fear point and then will religion die out? You can take the, the other one. <laughs> um, I think fear is, I think that, I think this is one of the worst things about religion is it scares you into not thinking and that's evil from the perspective of a morality of life, it's paralyzing your means of survival. Um, and I had a student in university from Pakistan, uh, and he came up to me after classes, this was actually in the same course, uh, and he said, hey, I'm starting to think that, that atheism is right, and my girlfriend and I are reading some things about this, and he's also from Pakistan, um, he was a business major or something, and he said, but this is really scary. Uh, he said, I can't talk to my pa family about it. I'll never tell my father. He'll send me back to Pakistan. I mean, this is a, you're leaving the faith, and this is, I mean, I could get killed. Uh, and it's, it's shut down your mind when you have these questions. Devil, get thee behind me. You know, it's that approach. It's whenever you have that doubt, you slam your mind shut. Because in that, that is horrible. And that can have a really paralyzing effect on thought and then, you know, in the child's development and stuff. Um, uh, the other question is, will, it, will, will religion, do you think it will eventually die out? I think to the extent that we, re, we retain, A, the freedom of thought, the freedom of speech, uh, and B, philosophers and, and intellectuals can get back to thinking that reason works, uh, and, to, and to promote it and to advocate it, yeah. I mean, you watch the range of the miraculous shrinking. As knowledge grows, it's shrinking, 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 you know, and it's... Draw the, draw the conclusion, you know. Um, so what, what was the... The other, other one was, um, uh, do you think uh, that faith is more powerful oh. than reason in the sense in the way it can interact with somebody's psychology? Um, no, I don't. But what, what Aaron was bringing up, the fear is a powerful motivator. And it's one of the... This is... So people say there's not a real battle between faith and reason. I think there is. Um, and I think... The, some of the greatest heroes in the history of the West and in the history of thought 
are the people in very religious periods who stood up um, and who said, no, I don't agree, and I don't think this is right. Um, and whether you take people like Galileo in doing it in regard to science, whether you take some of the early philosophers, and even when they're compromised in certain kinds of ways, like Descartes, there's a way in which um, <clears throat> it is difficult, but reason is more powerful. And when you start to open that door, many, many people can follow. And it is, I mean, the world today is much easier to reject religion than, say, if you were in 16th century Europe. Um, and that's as a result of people going by reason and challenging religious authority. And it's really, really important to do that. And these people should be regarded as heroes. And, and they once were um, in a way that they're not today, I think. And it, that, it takes an enormous amount of courage to do that. But it, reason is more powerful. So when people start to open that door, many people go through it. But even like with your example of um, 17 different um, uh, arguments, would you still stop believing in God? No, I still believe in God. Though. Yeah, but I can't make him think. So I, I've been interrupted, but that's the kind of thing. It's like you, you have to choose to use your mind and this is the free will stuff. You have to choose to use your mind and to think, am I, the, am I on a quest for truth or not? But, but and it's good. To, yeah, go ahead. I mean, even in the example you're giving, he is opening a door for the person. So it's good, a self-realization, like, yeah, the arguments doesn't really matter to me. It's I'd, have, I'd hold on to this even if you knock down all 17 of these. And the, and, but then that person has a choice about, maybe I should think about this. Like, is this a good, that's what you brought up? In the, is yeah. this a good reason to hold on to things? And that's opening a door for a person, which he can then much easy, more easily go through. Yeah. So I'm, I don't think of that person as hopeless. No. I mean, maybe he did no. come to question yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can we say that by some sense idea of determinism and uh, free will are mutually non-exclusive and uh, how you were born, uh, nature and nurture and where you were born is like the one's potential and what you do about it is uh, the choice between uh, thinking and willful blindness and if so, uh, is uh, positive eugenics a good uh, way to uh, being a good parent and taking care of your potential child? Um, so on the first part of it, so I don't, as I, I think I said in w w the previous question period, you can't equate nature and nurture with determinism. So I was bringing them up as this is what determines you, some combination of these. But are nature and nurture real? Are they things and factors in the world that have causal effects? Yes, I think it's unquestionable that they do, but they don't determine a person's course in life. And the fundamental is the choices that he, make, and you, uh, that he makes or he or she makes. And yes, you can think of that in the sense that it sets a certain potential, though I, wouldn't, I don't think of it quite as potential. It sets certain initial circumstances. Um, and that's the circumstances of your life, of who you are, um, in, in the sense of your genetic makeup and what environment you happen to be. You don't choose where to be born, who your parents are. So that's, it's a given in that sense. I don't think of it quite as a potential. It's actual. This is what you are. But then you have your course in life is set by the choices that you make given those circumstances. <clears throat> but the other point about positive eugenics, I'm not sure exactly what you mean, but choosing an appropriate partner to make sure that your child has special, some kind of better initial starting? I'm not sure what you meant. Well, choosing your partner uh, in vitro, et cetera, in difference of, uh, for example, killing uh, stupid people, like it's negative uh, eugenics. No, I don't. So I, I don't think they're a big factor in life, and that's certainly any kind of government kind of program, if you think of eugen. But even it's selecting a partner. The idea that the, what it would be selecting on is the genetics, of it and not is this person rational? Yeah. Um, and uh, do I think they have good values? And, so that, that, and that that's what will, if you're bringing up a child, that's what will matter, not it, it, it's, it, it's um, they're six feet four or something like that. that that's what well, I don't it, say it doesn't uh, matter. But it's, it, I mean, it so dwarfs everything else yeah. that it is. Um, I mean, with the advent of science, there will be kinds of issues that will arise 
um, for genetic manipulation and things like that. But that's a different kind of issue. Yeah, where you can choose toward, like, you, you're yeah. less susceptible to diseases, yeah. certain kind of diseases and things like that. Yeah, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't choose according to who's good breeding stock. Uh, um, I would choose according to who's rational, what their values are, you know. Uh, and I, I, I don't think you were exactly suggesting that. But, but is uh, genetic uh, manipulation a valid way, right? To being a good parent. I didn't understand that. Yeah, I didn't. Is genetic, uh, uh, genetic ma manipulation a, a valid way of being a good parent? Potential no. parent? No. Why so? Only in the sense that if you wanted to have a child and that you were going to be their parent and you're going to raise them, if you had the choice and you, had the, you could afford it to have some kind of be ab ability to manipulate it so it's that it wouldn't have certain kind of defects or diseases or something like that. I mean I, I mean, I would if I had the ability to do that. If I was contemplating a child, my wife, and they said, the doctor says, well, we can do a test on, uh, to make sure that, uh, so that the fetus doesn't have a cerebral palsy or some kind of like debilitating disease. Sure. Okay. I mean, I, you know, because you, you give the child a way better life uh, and it makes your life more enjoyable with your child and it just makes it, it's, it's win, win, win. Okay. But other than yeah. that, I would... Yeah. I don't know. Okay, thanks. Last question. Um, so my question um, surrounds the fact that objectivism is certainly a philosophy of a great self-esteem for people who... It, it's a philosophy uh, of the great self-esteem. Uh, oh, great great self-esteem, self yes. Uh, and in the era that we have many, many false information going through the net and um, actually through academia means uh, also, uh, how do we determine what's true or what's not if we are not um, looking at our, um, let's say, authorities? Uh, I don't like this word, but... Uh, experts. You know, uh, experts. Specialists. Yeah. Yeah, um, people with specialized knowledge. How, how do we uh, distinguish people who are claiming to be experts and the true ones and whether the objectivists should rely on the views of those so-called experts? And in, to, to what extent? Uh, we'll probably split this up, but I'll go ahead and start. Um, I, I said this in a talk before, but when somebody says, scientists say, and you're like, oh, you're supposed to believe it. Yeah, 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 yeah that's, I know, that, you're that's not why, on, that's why, yeah. that's, that's why so, I'm But it, you can up. put it as, how do, you, how do you sort out what you can rely on when you're not an expert in these various fields? Like people in uh, microbiology are saying this, and people in physics, theoretical physics, are saying this. Um, you'd have to investigate. Uh, yeah, because, I mean, there are well, a couple different things. There, there's a whole bunch of things that you could say to this. If you start to see that the state of the field um, is not really paying attention or is dismissing alternative theories and evidence without, like, I mean, the climate kind of issue, uh, that it's, they don't take alternative uh, perspectives on the issue seriously, they don't look at the other evidence and the way in which the issues are presented is every 10 years we're going to die and nothing ever happens, like for decades and decades and decades and decades and are wrong about everything. And they don't change the views. Yeah, you should think the, the, the fact that somebody says they're an authority on that should mean nothing. Um, if you, if you, if a particular scientific field is making leaps and bounds of progress, real progress, innovations, inventions, new techniques, new, and it's just then you start to build. They're building a real track record, and they're doing something right. Now, I don't know enough about this field, like like, like uh, genetics and so on. I don't, I, haven't, I don't, I don't study it. Um, but the kinds of leaps and bounds that they're making is just, it's, it's grounds for thinking that they're using methodologies that are uh, at least fundamentally valid. Um, but as a, as, a, as, a non, as a layman consumer of science, I mean, you have to figure out what you know and what you don't. And are you following, are you, again, following science? You know, go ahead. You can I mean, I would also add, so you have to hold, when you're accepting something from an expert, you have to hold, that's my grounds. Yeah, and you really have to know, I, it's, I don't know this firsthand, I'm relying on these experts. And then in evaluating experts, there's all kinds of things that go into it. So you bring the up, scientists say. Part of the reason that is so easy to dismiss is, what does it mean scientists say? It means some reporter is reporting in some story that this is what all scientists say. I have a very, but now in the sense of assessing expertise. And this is generalizing, but um, well, you're bringing up quite a controversial topic of, for example, uh, climate. Uh, but well, I'm not bringing uh, up, it can be, I, I view this for nutrition, I view this for actually all kinds of medical things when they say, this is what doctors say, this is what scientists say. It's some journalist who's reported this. And if you try to trace 
I don't have, so part of my view is I don't have a very high opinion of journalists today, um, that, that they do research and so on. When you look into it, they talk to one scientist, they haven't asked, uh, do, are there any dissenting views about this in regard to, and what is the evidence for this? So I'll give you an actual thing for a medical. It was that we had a worry for a family member about that their B12 is way low. And how did they come up with this recommended daily allowance of B12? And I traced it. And it ended up a study of eight people <laughs> who were not at all diverse. And so, and this is what it was all based on. And that is, there's a lot of things like this in medical and nutrition when it's, it, the repetition is not evidence. So that eight journalists repeat it, it's on. It still has one data point of eight people a study that is not at all conclusive. So, and this, when you start, when you get a few things like this, it leads you, I don't have very high confidence when I read about nutrition things and so on, that, there, that this has any meaning. But this is what it means to assess experts. It's like, how are you coming up with these issues? How is this reported? How does it get filtered from the scientist to the newspaper to now you're hearing about it and so on? And you have to have an assessment of all these kinds of things. It's a demanding responsibility. But if you don't want to just accept something on authority, and you're think, you have to have grounds for thinking this person is an expert. Okay. And what are your grounds for thinking that? Yes, but yeah. now you're talking about the more uh, stuff that I can allow myself to get a higher dosage of skepticism. But for example, let's take a look at the situation when uh, I have to prepare, for example, a computer system that manages some kind of scientific facility, and I have no idea what the topics are being covered in this facility. Uh, so I have to rely on experts, and uh, I cannot allow myself to uh, go into my own research that, that very much, because there is no time, there is no uh, means to perceive it. So uh, how do I determine who should I uh, look upon to, to get the right results? I don't quite get that example, like the details of that example, so maybe we can talk about that offline. Um, mm, okay. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, how much of that would you actually need to know in order to design the program, or is this just a division of labor, and you're, yeah. doing, you're doing the programming and stuff, and these guys are doing the other science, and you, maybe you don't need to know. Yeah, but, but if you do, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So but, if you, but if you do need to know that, then we need to, it's, there's more that we can talk about here. Mm, okay. But we're, we're, we're around, and there's another Q&A. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. We'll have a Q&A later this afternoon. Yeah. Thank you, Aaron and, and Onkar. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss a video.